Hi everyone, welcome to our January 2021 Mini Med School. I'm Emma Eggleston, the Dean of the WVU School of Medicine Eastern Campus. Tonight's Mini Medical School topic is innovations in neurosurgery, and I'm delighted to introduce our speaker, Dr. Jonathan Sherman. Dr. Sherman is one of our neurosurgical team here at the Rockefeller Neurosciences Institute Eastern Campus. He joined us from George Washington University where he was on the faculty. Dr. Sherman trained at the University of Virginia and at the Sloan Kettering Cancer Institute. So Dr. Sherman and I actually overlapped in our prior careers together. I'm a lot older than he is, but I was on junior faculty at the University of Virginia in endocrinology, and Dr. Sherman was completing his neurosurgery residency program and went on to be chief resident there in the University of Virginia program, which is one of the best in the country. So he and I share a love of the pituitary gland. And because tonight's a mini med school, I'm gonna teach you just a little bit about the pituitary. So the pituitary is your master gland and it sits right here in a little bony room called the cella tersica, uh, which means Turkish saddle. And it's like your Wizard of Oz gland. So it controls most of the other glands in your body and tells them the hormones that you need to kind of respond to life, respond to stress and keep us all alive. So it controls your thyroid, controls your adrenal glands, controls your gonads amongst other things. But like all glands, the pituitary can go into overdrive and uh, develop growths and other abnormalities. And when that happens, we endocrinologists need the skilled hands of our neurosurgery colleagues to treat that and change our patients' lives. In addition to being an expert in pituitary surgery, um, Dr. Sherman is also a lead in neuro-oncology and the treatment of rare but devastating brain tumors. He's won multiple patient care awards and here on the Eastern Campus has jumped right in to teaching our medical students, residents, and all of us, his fellow providers. I'm sure you're going to learn a lot tonight and thank you, Dr. Sherman. Uh, good evening, my name is uh, Jonathan Sherman and I am a neurosurgeon at the WVU East Campus. Um, I am a associate professor of neurosurgery and the director of surgical neuro-oncology for the East Campus. And tonight's presentation will be discussing the new innovations in neurosurgery that we are bringing to the WVU uh, Rockefeller Neuroscience Institute. And so as I uh, go over this presentation tonight, you'll be able to see all the exciting things we're doing to really benefit our patients and uh, also benefit our uh, medical students and residents as they understand and can better uh, prepare for surgical procedures and make it safe, safer for our, our patients. So to give a little background on me, uh, so I uh, performed my undergraduate training at Georgia Tech. Uh, I was a chemical and engineer undergrad. And in that training, uh, I always had a vision when I went into medical school of working with engineering and working with new innovations. And uh, neurosurgery gives an excellent opportunity for that. And so, you know, when I have been going through my career, uh, I've used that training and understanding and be able to really talk the lingo on the engineering side, even though I don't have the, uh, you know, the physics training or the actual uh, development, I can work closer with a uh, variety of different types of engineers and we can work together from my medical uh, background to develop these new innovations, be an end user and actually utilize these uh, innovations. And then when we see any, issues or anything that comes up on trying to implement, then we can modify that. So I'm excited that I'm now being at WVU, I can utilize that background. So I went to uh, Augusta University Medical College of Georgia where I did my uh, medical school training. Uh, then I did my uh, training for residency in neurosurgery at the University of Virginia. I was very fortunate, fortunate to spend a year in Auckland City Hospital in Auckland, New Zealand. So I really got an exposure to uh, different environments, different ways of, uh, you know, of how, uh, you know, how medicine works. And it gave me a good perspective coming in to uh, my career to be able to, you know, develop and uh, develop these, you know, 
different uh, modalities so that we can better our patients' uh, outcomes and, and, and improve how our patients do. And then I was also fortunate to spend a year at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center where I performed a neurosurgical oncology fellowship. And that gave me an opportunity to really you know, learn to manage patients in the respect that it's not just about surgery, but it's all the pre-planning, brain, the spine, peripheral nervous system, you know, all of the interoperative planning, and then the post planning where I work closely with my uh, medical and radiation oncologists, as well as primary care physicians and the variety other of other physicians such as rehabilitation doctors, and the list goes on and making sure that we're all a team in managing these patients. And that's what I've brought to WVU, and especially on the Eastern campus, so that it's a multidisciplinary program. And incorporating into that program is all of these innovations, which we're gonna talk, to about, talk about tonight. And so my first uh, uh, job after fellowship was at George Washington University. And uh, I immediately tried to integrate uh, that collaboration with not only engineers, but also my fellow um, physicians in learning about new technologies. And so I started working with a mechanical engineer right off the bat, and we started developing a technology that we're still working on and in, uh, integrating into improved cancer care for patients with malignant brain tumors, uh, with brain cancer. You know, I started working with uh, different companies that, uh, you know, and I always made a very uh, clear point to never be consultant for these companies. I just wanted to be able to learn about them so that we can bring them on campus and actually uh, expand, our, expand our reach. And so I started working groups at GW and it gave me a lot of experience in what, what I call translational research. And when I, when I talk about that, what that means is if there's something out there that, we, that is a new modality or a new treatment, you know, it's really saying, how do we most effectively get that to the patients? How do we get that to any of our patients in the community uh, and to other doctors, even outside of neurosurgery, to best improve our patients' outcomes? So that's what I really learned through the nine years I spent at GW. Now, uh, most recently in September, I joined uh, the, the family at WVU we were previously known as WVU Medicine Brain and Spine. Uh, we've now changed our name to the WVU Rockefeller Neuroscience Institute. And what this does is it really expands our reach, expands our armamentarium, because the WVU RNI is a system that really expands beyond Morgantown. It's on the East Campus. It's really in multiple campuses throughout the WVU system. And it allows us to connect to multiple partners in research, in, in clinical care, so that we can think outside the box as we bring in these new innovations. And so I'm very excited to be part of this. And, on, and this is what really separates us because when we uh, expand out to uh, outside of the East Campus in Martinsburg and really start working on you know getting p patients and clinicians to know about us in the District of Columbia, Maryland, Virginia, and Pennsylvania, they can really see that you know this is a destination center. And on the East Campus, that's what we hope to be, a destination center for patients to come around the region to get the best care. So this is our team at the WVU East. We have John Crusoe leads the charge with our group. Mark Lyerly is uh, one of my colleagues. These are, we're the neurosurgery contingent. Uh, Les Foster and Shoji Ishigami are our uh, pain medicine and rehabilitation doctors. And so this is just the start. This is our group, you know, uh, up to three years ago, um, we didn't have a neurosurgery presence on the East Campus. Uh, Dr. Caruso started that, brought both of us on board, brought, you know, brought Dr. Foster and Ishigami as well. And then you look at what we can treat, you know, we can treat the herniated discs, the back pain, degenerative spine disease, pinched nerves, you know, all of the spine related issues, you know, accidents and injuries of the spine. And then we move on to the more complex things related to the tumor world, where I come in, which is the brain and spinal tumors, pituitary tumors, all of these varieties we can treat. And when we're looking at treating these, we're actually in the process of expanding. And what does that mean? Well, you know, we have neurosurgery and rehabilitation in our group. Well, our goal is to expand that beyond that. You know, orthopedic surgery, neurology, uh, behavioral medicine. So that it's really uh, an opportunity to ex expand multidisciplinary care. And on top of that, radiation oncology, medical oncology. So all that's under the purview of our treatment team so that we can cover all these areas and you don't have to go to multiple places to get your care. That's our goal at the WVU East Rockefeller Neuroscience Institute. And that's a goal of the main campus as well, is that it's really what we call a kind of a one-stop shop. You can get all of your care and you can really leave knowing that you're being treated well and you're getting the best treatment available for you.
So when we talk about our primary objectives, you know, when I talk about this, we're integrating cutting edge techniques and technologies. This can include imaging, it can include surgical adjuncts, adjuvant care, that means chemotherapy, radiation, all of these are integrated. And as I said, it's a comprehensive team, especially as the director of the Nurse Surgical Oncology Program for the East Campus, we're talking about seamless integration between nurse surgery, neurology, all these other things I mentioned. And it includes clinical and basic science research. And that's not just limited to the main campus in Morgantown. We're looking and uh, working to expand that capabilities on the east so that as we integrate these technologies we can see what they're doing and that's what i talk about as end user we're doing those things but we can also make them better we can actually uh, take a technology or an innovation and see new avenues and that's where that's that translational thing i talk about say you know what are our clinical problems what are our educational needs what are our research needs and how do we take something that exists and make it better so two of the things that we, uh, the, the easy uh, add-ins that we just brought in, and I say easy, these are things that right when I started, we, were, we brought on campus. One of them is glial I'll talk about that. And the other one is the surgical theater program. And uh, the, the first, uh, I actually was part of the FDA approved a trial that brought in this drug, which is actually a, flu a fluoroflor. It's a fluorescent uh, drug that allows us to see tumors better. And I'll show what that means. Surgical Theater is a virtual and augmented reality company. I brought them on about five years ago at GW, expanded across the campus. It wasn't just neurosurgery, we had thoracic surgery, uh, you know, general surgery. And we're doing that now at WVU, expanding it to thoracic surgery, ENT, urology. And I'll explain what that does. So this is, this is a bright area of tumor. So imagine, if you will, that when we're removing a tumor, sometimes it's hard to see with our, with our eyes what the tumor looks like. Imagine if you can give a drug and all this dark area is not tumor and this pink area is tumor. So that gives us a better removal of the tumor. And why is that important? Because the literature is very clear. The more of the tumor we can remove, in the process of keeping a patient the same pre-op and post-op, that means no new deficits, no new problems, but we remove more of the tumor, patients live longer, especially in the malignant aggressive cancer type brain tumors. So here's a video that actually combines both the surgical theater 360 reconstructive image that we can achieve as well as the glial and fluorescent guided surgery. And so what we used to think was that the two dimensional view that we explained to patients actually provided a adequate way of showing what we're going to do surgically. And what we realize now is that we can do better. And so by generating a 360 degree view where we can actually see where the tumor is and see what it actually looks like to the patient so they can actually see their own head, their own tumor, their brain, then that allows us to properly explain to the patient what we're dealing with. So we can do that in the clinic. And then on top of that, in the operating room, we can map out with a wand and actually point to certain critical areas. And we can say, all right, this on the skull correlates with this 360 reconstructive image. And then we can see important things like the yellow tumor. We can see the blue veins and the red arteries. We can see the optic radiations, the green vision fibers that we don't want to injure. We can see the blue areas of motor movement and the facial pink areas and the hand orange areas that are critical starting points that allow us to move our face in our hand. And if we know where those areas are, then once we start working with the uh, patient in the operating room, we can protect those areas. And then when we're in the clinic, we can explain that to the patients. So this starts in the clinic explaining it and then moves into the operating room. And it provides us everything that we really need to be able to do to be able to you know, map out a, an appropriate surgical procedure so that we're providing what's most important, having the patient before surgery leave the operating room as they are you know, after surgery without any new deficits, any new, you know, any new issues. And so then we can actually, what a lot of patients want is a video. They want to see, well, what did it look like in the operating room? And so we can incorporate snapshots, you know, where we see, all right, well, this was our preoperative tumor. We see this, you know, this area that lights up with the whiteness. We can point out exactly where we were during surgery, which is these snapshots. And then we can actually incorporate the video. And here, this, was, this patient was awake. And so we can uh, correlate with the awake surgery, you know, 
where we are, what, where we've removed most of the tumor and we think we're done, then we put on this blue light on our microscope and we can actually see these pink areas. And this pink area is the residual tumor. But if this is just like when we see, you know, important structures in the preoperative imaging, we don't want to remove those important structures. So we can, as we're removing tumor, we need to make sure that we're not being led down a rabbit hole, removing some of that tumor. And so what we can do is we can actually take uh, this bipolars, these, this uh, instrument that allows us in the operating room to stimulate the brain and say, all right, are there certain areas that are moving? Are there certain speech areas that we're dealing with that then allow us to safely remove that tumor? And so that, in that way, the patient in an awake fashion is, you know, able to talk to us and we can see if their face moves or if they stop talking or things like that. And then we say, yep, it's safe to remove this pink area of tumor. And that gives us a better resection. But in this case, when we can see on the post-operative imaging, we get this, these 2D views where we say, you know what? We did a nice resection. We removed about 98% of this tumor. And that little arrow that we see on the imaging actually correlates to residual tumor. And why didn't we remove that area? Because that area of the tumor actually was right next to those cortical spinal fibers, those critical movement fibers and we want to protect those so you know so this surgical theater program allows us to combine all these modalities as you can see and then the patient gets the, the feel for what that pink stuff actually means why are they drinking this you know this uh, uh, fluid this drug to help us see things better and so it's for clinical use as I said, patient engagement, they better understand things, research, and educational programs. I mean, our medical students and residents better understand what we're doing because they can see it real time and they can help me plan out surgery. They say, how would you do this? And we can talk about that. And so, as I said, this is how we used to explain it. And, you know, this is a patient that's actually wearing uh, the headset. They're flying into their own head and they're actually able to see real time what, you know, what our plan is. And then we can take something like this, you know, it's, it's hard for students and residents to understand where that is. And you reconstruct it and you say, ah, how are we gonna get there? And then you can say, all right, well, this is, these, this, in this case, this is this blue corticospinal. That's that blue motor fibers, those highways in the brain. This little yellow thing is what we wanna figure out what it is. We wanna biopsy this. So we actually using our, surgical theater programming had two trajectories, which is the safest. And we picked a trajectory that's the long axis of meaning that we can get the most of our biopsy safely. And so then, you know, we can actually have this video, which helps us understand that. This patient is a 60 year old female who initially presented with a new onset seizure. Her imaging showed a small area of flare signal abnormality. On follow-up imaging, there was a clear area of progression with a cystic portion in the center of the mass. We used the virtual reality system with a 360-degree reconstruction to help us plan out this surgical approach. From the location of the tumor, it was clear that this lesion was just behind the primary motor fibers. To get the cyst out, we wanted to be along the long axis of the cyst. We use the system to draw out all of the fiber tracts, including the corticospinal tracts, and then we showed the, the tumor relative to those corticospinal tracts. We also incor incorporated the functional MR imaging of the hand and foot areas. By using this trajectory, we were able to remove the entirety of the cyst as can be seen on this post-op MRI. The patient stayed in the hospital one night and went home on post-op day number one. Now we can see, based on our biopsy trajectory, that we used a very sharp angle to get to the mass, and it can give us a clear indication of how much is left of the tumor, that's our residual tumor, and how much we were actually able to remove. After this surgical intervention, she had no additional seizures with the final diagnosis of a WHO grade 3 astrocytoma. So that kind of gives you perspective. And this is what we could do in the clinic. So imagine a patient is sitting there with the headset on. We're actually walking through, this is our virtual reality tech. We're actually walking through the case, you know, in educate patients on pathology approaches, how are different options for how we can get there. And it piece, gives patients peace of mind, understanding, and really kind of a content they can show family and friends to say, you know, this is what I had done. And that's what a lot of patients do want. They want to get a feel for what happened to them. 
And so this is our virtual reality room at Berkeley Medical Center on the East Campus. And so here we actually have a, a place where the patients can come in. We have this large screen where they can put the headset on and every patient gets a virtual reality experience. Is it, you know, it's not just limited to oncologic care, any of our patients, spine patients, you know, any other, uh, any other types of um, non-tumor related surgery that we do, all patients can get this access. And so we just started this program in the last couple weeks and we're excited that all our patients get this opportunity. So what other things are we doing on the innovation world? Awake craniotomy program, motor mapping. So if we're gonna do this, we have to be able to, on the East Campus and the main campus, be able to safely remove tumors. So it's not only looking at things better, we have to be able to know where they are, just like the, I showed you that, that uh, bipolar where I put it on the brain. I have to be able to do that uh, here. And we have to be able to find out where the motor and sensory areas are, these strips of brain tissue that, you know, that are highly functional and we don't wanna remove them. And we also want to do language mapping where we can say, all right, this area right here is very important to, so people can get the words out that they want to get out. And we want to make sure we protect those. So uh, I work closely with colleagues, both nationally, internationally, and, uh, and locally to develop a protocol, an awake craniotomy protocol that we're using across our different campuses that includes patient, you know, patient exclusion criteria. Who shouldn't get awake surgery? How do we inter introduce neuropsychology, that whole behavioral health aspect? You know, anesthesia, very important. You know, there should be protocols for neurosurgery, anesthesia, neuropsychology, and all the team in the OR so that they know pre-op, interop, and post-op, you know, how these patients are doing. And the advantage of introducing neuropsychology is patients get a better feel for, you know, the behavioral things that might be affecting them. You know, maybe, you know, why they're tired all the time or why they're always getting headaches and, you know, how that can affect their mood and their disposition because disposition, because we know that patients that actually have a better mood, and it's hard to have a good mood when you have a malignant brain tumor, but it's knowing that they're gonna get the best surgery and the best chance of beating this, you know, this cancer, then they, patients do better. And so in, integrating neuropsychology is critical in that. And so we've created this protocol and we just presented it in December at the 30th International Conference on Public Mental Health and Neurosciences, where we actually, uh, between neuropsychology and myself, presented our protocol that we're going to be using on campus on the East, as well as in the main campus in Morgantown. And so also you can't just have the interoperative, you know, processes, you have to be able to preoperatively know what we're dealing with. And that's this functional imaging program. We need to know where the tumor is. We need to create these fibers so we can see the highways in the brain and the functional areas. So we've introduced that and upgraded our MRI capabilities on the main campus. And they're utilizing this is also in the Morgantown campus, but especially for our East Campus patients that are going to be coming from the DMV, District of Columbia, Maryland, Virginia, they can have as good of a imaging, if not better, than uh, any place in the region. And so we can actually see, you know, if you look at these two sides, that's those motor fibers. So this tumor is splitting those motor, motor fibers. Why is that important? One, it affects how I'm gonna remove this. I can't just go in there and just remove it as one piece because that's gonna potentially injure those fibers. But two, I can explain to a patient why they're weak and why those fibers are affecting them as opposed to the other side where the red is actually away from these two tumors and that's not affecting those fibers. So that's, it helps the patient understand it better and it helps me plan my surg surgery better. The other thing we're building up is stereotactic radio surgery. What does that mean? Well, you know, traditionally, 15, 20 years ago, we were doing folk, you know, uh, focused radiation to an entire brain. So it sounds contradictory to say focus to the entire brain, but we're saying we're only going to radiate the brain. We're, we're going to avoid the neck and the head. And that was fine for a while because you could say we can give radiation just to the brain where these tumors are. But the problem is there's a lot of normal brain tissue, just like in the spine, a lot of normal spine tissue, uh, the spinal cord, you know, normal fibers that, in the brain that can be injured by radiation. What if we could give a focal shot of radiation that allows us to, you know, be able to just treat the tumor and avoid all those normal structures? Because wouldn't you like to avoid radiation to parts of the brain and spine and the peripheral nervous system, the rest of the body that don't need radiation and you're going to have normal function? So we are, and we have already upgraded our systems at, on the East Campus to allow us to do this. And this is a whole program and it's highly integrated between medical and radiation oncology and neurosurgery to make sure that we know which patients should get this. Because every patient is an individual and we have to follow them closely. And so we've developed this and we're in the 
process of introducing our first patients to this technology on the east. The other thing uh, is interoperative ultrasound. So, you know, if you look, so this is a device we have here in the operating room, and here's a, a, a mass. And so when we do this navigation, when I talk about the wand that I'm putting on the head, that's really helpful, right? But as soon as I open up the skull, open up the covering of the brain, the brain shifts a little bit. So suddenly my wand is telling me on my screen that's where the tumor is, but I, I might not see it there because the brain shifted a little bit. This ultrasound, just like you would have an ultrasound for a variety of different things, ultrasound of your heart, ultrasound for childbirth, there's lots of different re, you know, ways we can integrate that. And then we're doing this for the brain and spinal cord. This is the one for the brain, this is the one for the spinal cord. And then at the end, I can actually see that I've removed the tumor. If you combine that with the uh, glioland that we talked about earlier, then we can really maximize our removal of these tumors. The other thing we're integrating on the east is cerebell. So bef well, before I started, one of, one of the issues is that patients would come in and we weren't sure if they were having seizures. And we didn't have full access to be able to do this around the clock. So patients would come in and, they, and sometimes they wouldn't be able to answer our questions or do the things we wanted them to do from an exam standpoint. And it was a problem. And we might have to ship them to long distances away from their family and friends and because we didn't have that capability. That's not a problem anymore because we can put this little strip around the head and it can tell us, is this patient having a seizure? And if they are, we can give them medications to stop that seizure. And so that adds safety to our patients and gives our doctors a lot of information outside of neurosurgery, neurology, you know, with the epilepsy group here, you know, the ER doctors, so they can, you know, know if they should call neurology because they have this type of device to say, yep, I'm concerned this patient's actually having a seizure. For a variety of reasons, for whatever the reason they're having it, at least we can identify what the problem is. So we're integrating this technology on the East as well. Future developments. La laser interstitial thermal therapy. What is that? Well, there's some very deep tumors that we can't treat by open surgery, or we can, but it puts a lot of risk to the patient. So imagine a little electrode that in the MRI scanner we can put into the brain, and that allows us to actually, with MRI, we can actually see the temperature in the brain. And by putting the, this diode into the brain, we can burn that tissue. and as opposed to just biopsying a deep tumor, we can actually now burn that deep tumor and that burning allows us to essentially remove the tumor. And so it allows us an increased armamentarium to treat. They're, they're already doing this in Morgantown. On the east, you know, we're still working out the technology as we've just upgraded our MRI, but in the next year, we're gonna be integrating this as well. And this gives a lot of value to our patients as we can give them more options on the east campus. So here's an example. Here's this deep tumor. That's in, this is in the stem of the brain. That's a very important area of the brain that going through all that normal tissue is gonna be very difficult. And so we can put an electrode in and biopsy it, prove that it is a tumor. And then this is our heat map and we can safely burn that tumor. And this patient had a malignant glioblastoma, a, a brain cancer, and without Without this treatment, normally, you know, was it a cure? No. Uh, normally, this patient would live six to 12 months. They lived about two and a half years. So we gave them increased time with their family, even though we couldn't cure this aggressive brain cancer. Other future developments. Uh, imagine an MRI scanner in the operating room. People are using that nationally. And we could introduce that here. So this allows us to say, all right, well, I'm as I'm removing tumor, I can do an MRI so when the brain shifts and I can't see as much and that ultrasound's there and I'm not sure, this is an additional adjunct that we can say, all right, now I can get a new MRI while the patient's in the operating room and give myself more confidence that I've removed as much of the tumor as safely possible. Then we go on the you know, research side. Novacure is a type of treatment that's been yeah, I was part of the uh, Medicare approval for this nationally. It's a treatment for malignant brain tumors. You wear this device on your head. You have to shave your head every four days. You have to wear it 18 to 21 hours a day. It increases survival of these patients. Patients do better. What if we could do better than that? So I, when I was working at, at GW, um, we were talking about this cold atmospheric plasma. Now at WVU, I'm still working with my colleague and we're working on uh, multiple grants including uh, NIH-related grants, to take this type of tube, imagine tubes going around the head, that can do the same thing as this Novacure can. It can actually work with the chemotherapy and radiation to improve survival. What's the difference? The amount of energy 
that it takes to do this versus this is significantly less. So we could potentially affect patients less, but get the same effect negatively less, but get the same positive benefits. And also this can be done in five minutes based on our early data. We need a lot more research to kind of prove this. But our early data says as opposed to 18 to 21 hours, a five minute treatment can get you the same result. And so we're in the process of proving this. And we'll, we're working with, the, with my colleagues in Morgantown and on the East to have a potential clinical trial where our patients with malignant brain tumors can, try, can work with this technology to prove its, its results that they will have just as much survival benefit, if not more, than the Novacure device. So it's early days. But this is the exciting stuff when I talk about translational research. This is the ultimate of translational research. Taking something that we've, I've talked about with my colleague at GW nine, 10 years ago, and now at WVU, now it's coming to a point where we can integrate it into actual patient care. So the Rockefeller Neuro Neuroscience Institute, I, I approve, uh, I'm sorry, ex please excuse the um, way it uh, formatted, but you know, when I got to WVU, just like when I, when I was at GW, I said, let's get a working group together. Let's really see how we can advance technologies. This is the group of our, of our, uh, of our working group. So we have people across the campus on the east and the main campus, including leaders both in, both in both parts of our institution that say, we want to develop something better. And how do we do that? We link with potential industry sponsors, such as MindMaze which is linked with the Rockefeller Neuroscience Institute. And we're already talking to the Martinsburg VA to potentially have telehealth with physical therapy. So what does that mean? That means patients in their home can do physical therapy without someone coming to their home. They can use a system through a virtual reality or augmented reality where they can put a headset on where they can see the real world around them and do these exercises to improve their ability to walk. And so we're in the process of doing that. There's also, there's multiple projects that are, we're in the process of talking about, which, include, which we are integrating on the East Campus. Also includes pain management. Right now, we do injections. Our, our, our two doctors do injections for patients, but it requires some radiation. They have to do x-rays again and again to make sure that needle's in the right place. What if you could put a headset on, augmented reality, see the world around you, but you could actually navigate, just like we're in the operating room, and put that needle through, uh, you know, looking at a screen and say, that's where the needle goes, and you don't have to do the x-rays anymore. We're not radiating our patients anymore and they're getting the best results. And we're very accurately putting that needle where we wanna be. We're talking to one of these companies about that. And then what about you know, the um, you know, avatars? We, you, you see there's a movie avatar. There's, you know, um, you, when you go on these websites, you can create your own avatar of yourself. What if there was a patient that was, but it was a virtual patient. So you're looking at this virtual patient that is an avatar. It's a, someone that can talk back to you. And so, and that can, be do, that can help us in two categories. One, we're working with a company about diabetes. What if our patients could better understand their diabetes and better, and this is outside of neurosurgery, but better understand their diabetes by having scenarios that could say, if you do this, that, and the other, you will have better control of your diabetes or worse control. But they're not going into a center. They're literally at their home talking to this avatar and actually improving their control, their diabetes through this. And on the other side, we can have medical students and residents better understand how to treat patients with diabetes through the same avatar. So those are three examples of, in, which in, is the small portion of all the different type of projects. And all those are happening on the East Campus that we're developing at this time. And it's not just locally, we're part of an international virtual reality healthcare association that has national and international partners that help us understand what's out there, to know that we're not missing out on a company that might be able to come on campus and help work with us to utilize their current technology, and as I've said from the beginning, develop new technology that can help our patients. So the future of WU Medicine Brain and Spine is the WVU Rockefeller Neuroscience Institute, and that's what we are here and throughout the entire WVU system. So from the surgical neuro-oncology program, as I said, we're integrating neuro-oncology care through a multifaceted approach, neurology, neurosurgery, you know, neuropsychology and psychiatry, medical and radiation oncology, and really translational research so that we can better the outcome of our patients, which is really what this is. It's to give the best care in the region and make us a destination center. So I hope you've enjoyed the talk tonight. 
you know, these are my kids. They're uh, big supporters of this. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to give you a taste of what we're doing on the WVU Medicine East campus. And, you know, stay tuned because it's only going to get more exciting. Thank you for your time.